Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. Our guest for this edition of Insights and Sounds is musician and composer Patrick Gleason. He's a synthesizer pioneer known for his work with Herbie Hancock, as well as soundtrack work on Apocalypse Now, Knott's Landing, and a host of other stuff. He's co-founder of Different First Studios, and he's got a hell of a history. Stay tuned and check it out. My guest is composer, synthesist, and musician Patrick Gleason. Patrick, nice to see you. Good to see you. On your website, there's a reference to you taking piano lessons as a youngster. Yes. And then being more or less discouraged mm -hmm. by, um, by your, your mother's and your teacher's uh, disdain for jazz. Well, it wasn't even that, you know. It was more elemental. The woman next door, her name was Johnson, lovely lady, she had a growing son who played violin for the Seattle Symphony. Ah. And my mother always felt sorry for Mrs. Johnson because of her. <laughs> <laughs> because she had to listen to him play all the time? No, or? because, you know, I mean, her son wasn't really doing work fit for a man. Ah, okay. I mean, okay. you know. Hmm. So um, my mother was so far removed from jazz that I fell in love with it. By the third grade, I was reading out of uh, um, Mary uh, Lou Williams' little piano books for kids. I loved it. <clears throat> and then I would take, you know, the Brahms. I was, I, was, I was the best pianist in the school. So they gave me adult stuff to play. And then I would change it around so it sounded more like Mary Lou Williams. Ooh, improvising. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, we didn't know it was called that. Of course. And my mother would be in the kitchen. <laughs> I had wonderful parents. They just adored me and spoiled me and, and, and still attempted to discipline me. She'd say, Pat, that doesn't sound like your lesson. <laughs> and so then I would tone it down a bit. I had a hip cousin, Mary Gleason, long gone, a lovely woman. And her boyfriend was Norm Bobro, who was the reigning promoter for jazz in Seattle. So they knew where I was at and better than I did. I'd gone to a concert about a month or six weeks before this incident. And um, it was, um, I can't remember the pianist's name now. It's, you know, 60 years or 70 years or something. Marvelous piano player, black piano player. And uh, as we were leaving, I said, you know, this guy is really good, Mary. This is, this is somebody I'd really like to sound like. So Mary and Norm invite me to a Chinese dinner down in Chinatown. Pick me up, drive me down there, we're at dinner. And gosh, who shows up? I mean, it was a setup, of course. Of course. Uh -huh. <clears throat> The guy is, was wonderful. He, he was a, a vuncular, a little bit like Oscar Peterson. I mean, very uh -huh. big guy and very, you know, jovial, well, and, you well, jovial yeah. and well spoken and, you know, lots of uh, multisyllable words. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so uh, about 15 minutes into the, 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 the meal, Mary says, so um, to, to, to this man, he said, do you, do you ever take students? And he says, well, no, not usually. But why don't you fall by the pad and we'll see what happens. Fall by the pad and see what happens? Oh, fucking God. So That's way too hip. <laughs> it is incredible. So I go home. I run into the house. I tell my mother. She says, well, um, you'll need to ask your piano teacher. Now, by this time, I graduated from the, the nuns who did the best they could. They weren't very good teachers, but, and I had a guy that was even worse. <clears throat> he was uh, a German man who would, uh, quote, teach me from his dining room. He'd be eating dinner, crash, crash, dishes, <laughs> go back to there. You know, I mean, he had, oh, wow. all he cared Folding about. Folding it in, basically, yeah. Yeah, $5 a week. Uh -huh. That was it. Uh -huh. 
So they asked this guy, and he said, not until he has mastered the fundamentals. I'd been taking piano for nine years. I was playing Tchaikovsky and reading recitals. I hadn't mastered the fundamentals. I, ju I quit music. I just, I just, it really hurt. It really, really, really hurt. And I didn't, uh, I didn't really get back into jazz until probably when I moved to San Francisco and began teaching at San Francisco State, I always took my little um, upright piano with me and I began playing more and it, it, sort of improvising with what limited improvising skills I had. And then it, while I was at State, I was sitting in my little house, a little A-frame house, which is probably a million dollar house now <laughs> in Corte Madeira. Everything is by now up there. Yeah, yeah. Probably, probably, yeah, probably much more than a million. And um, I'm listening to Bartok's first violin concerto. And I dropped a half a tab of acid. That'll change things. And I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, my God, this is what I want to do. I, I don't want to teach. I want to, I want to make music like this, you know, <laughs> you know, okay, good luck let, with that. Let, let me stop you for a moment yeah. because there, part of what I'm curious about is you have this gap there of about what, 15, 10, 15 years, 15 years. What was your relationship to music during that time? Had you, you didn't abandon it completely, obviously. No, I, I, I became a listener. Interesting. Even though you still had chops, I mean, you weren't playing at all? You know, I, I, I used to, when I was in, in grade school, I would do my lesson, uh, probably a half hour of that every day. And then I would, I would uh, you know, do stuff that was not my lesson mm -hmm. <laughs> for right. another hour a day. So I was, for a kid, I was playing an hour you and a half inspired. a day. You were inspired, yeah. And, uh, um, you know, then I didn't touch a piano for probably until until I graduated and got my PhD, and then I had enough money to buy a, 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 a little upright piano mm -hmm. and began playing a little bit, not much. And then when I got down to San Francisco, then, then as I say, it really hit. And with that, I started making music concrete uh -huh. <clears throat> and um, playing that at, at the, the straight theater. And I uh, did uh, some little performances with Aunt, a couple of Anne Halpern's dancers at, mm -hmm. at the Anne Halpern workshop on Divisadero and stuff like that. I was getting back into it. And I remember I bought two huge Altec speakers that were about this high. Right, the big voice of the theater thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And I had them in my living room. <laughs> and, and one of the teachers from San Francisco State came by. I had a seminar that I was teaching at my house at night. It was graduate students. And uh, so the, the students wanted to hear the music. <laughs> I put on what I'd been doing. I was, by this time, I was working out at Mills College on mm -hmm. what turned out to be the very first Buchla box. Uh -huh. And I put this music on, which was, you know, not as polished as Morton's, Morton Sabotnik's uh, <laughs> Silver Apples of the Moon, but in that say, general that's direction. A, that's a high bar, though. And yeah. cranked it up. And the, I remember the look on this guy's face. I mean, it was like, I'm going to be hit by a car. You know, <laughs> it was like that. <laughs> he just, it, it was, be, it didn't even dislike it. He, he just, or re, he wasn't even repulsed by it. He was just shocked into, into scared submission. What the hell is this? Yeah, what, what is going on here? Is this a joke? Are they playing for a fool? Or? Wow. <laughs> Let's back up a little bit. Yeah. Synthesis was just coming into vogue in those years. <laughs> I'm guessing that the combination of the revelation of listening to music under the influence, yeah. as well as the introduction of synthesis into your life, probably, no pun intended, somewhat instrumental in bringing you back into music. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was, as I say, I was doing these little music concrete performances. Mm -hmm. I, if I had a spare classroom, uh, an empty classroom at State, I would put on a little, you know. But you were not, but you were teaching what? Literature or something, uh, 18th right? century English literature. Which has, it, it's kind of hard to justify how that intertwines with music. Um, it doesn't. You just took faculty advantage of the proximity 
yeah. so to speak. Okay. Yeah, and, uh-huh. and I went to, to the uh, audio uh, sort of, you know, this, where they handed out stuff to teachers, and I would get like maybe six or eight woolen sacks, uh-huh. plug them all <laughs> together <laughs> with tape loops and stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I could see the limitations of that, and I can't remember who, oh, I know how, what happened. So I'm doing this music concrete put on a little uh, performance for these two dancer friends of mine um, at Ann Halpern's studio. They had a mini, uh, you could hardly call it a theater, but a room with uh, seats. Little black box thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. So in the adjacent room was what turned out to be Don Buchla's very first Buchla. That was where ah, the, uh-huh. the, the, the hipsters were gathered. It was Sabotnik and all these people. Sure. And uh, <clears throat> and I'd been over there. I I turned it on, and the music came out. <laughs> One of the dancers <laughs> said, "I don't think we're supposed to do that." So I turned it back <laughs> off again. <laughs> and, <Oops>. <laughs> so, but then then when it was gone, I said, "Where to go?" Mills College, blah blah blah, the t- tape center. So I went over there, and when you're young, you're brash. You of know, course. And I talked to Tony Nazo, and who was the, the facilities met guy over there. And I said, you know, I'd like to learn how to use that. He said, well, you know, uh, I can give you an hour a week. I said, hmm, how, how about more? He said, well, anyway, long story short, he made it evident to me that he could be bribed. Uh-huh. <laughs> If I gave the, 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 the Mills College Tape Center $1,000 so they could finish paying for a four-track, I could have one night a week. Mm. So I did that. So I would get over there on my motorcycle probably around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh-huh. and, uh, and I would go until daybreak. Stretching it as much as you could, of course. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> then I would go back over and teach my classes. Now, synthesis at that point was really... It was Wild West. Mm-hmm. I mean, things were so new in that yeah. sense. Yeah. And you had a lot of different artists working in different because there were no rules. You know, you had you had some right. I would say pop musicians adopting it for you know the Doors, yeah. Beatles, etc. Yeah. You had music concrete. You had Wendy Carlos doing classical. You had all of these yeah. different. There was no real, there were no rules at all, all right. in that sense. And you seem to have a pretty, I mean, even though you lean toward jazz, you seem to have a pretty diverse background, musically speaking, and a very diverse palette in terms of your, let's say, spanning genres. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, first of all, <clears throat> I, I've been, there's a part of me that's very angry and has been. I, the, the nuns did that. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and by the time I was in the eighth grade, I, I realized these people don't know anything that I don't know. Why am I spending my time going to church? Uh-huh. That was the last time I ever... Yeah. Entered. Well, they, they call it faith for a reason. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so that whole experience, and also they really didn't like smart people. Yes. Because they question things, yeah, right, right. which is the antithesis of faith. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> exactly. Very good. Uh, exactly. So, so uh, by the time I, I, and then the whole thing with music, I mean, those, the, the confluence of the, the nuns in, uh, in my life and the destruction of my uh, hopes for music uh-huh. it made me very angry. I can imagine that, yeah. It's and I'm still crushing your creativity. Yeah. yeah, and and something else contributed to it, which was, I'm standing outside the teaching room in the basement, of course, of St. Joseph's School, waiting for my lesson to begin, listening to this horrifying attempt at music coming from the interior. I must be looking pretty disturbed. The school janitor comes by. Um mid-sized black man in his probably late 30s at that point. Which was ancient to you at that yeah, point. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks down at me, because this is, I'm in the first grade. I'm like, yeah. He says, you doing okay? I began talking to him. I'd never heard a voice that sounded like that. The way he used English was, 
entirely different. It was, you know, a black accent. Mm -hmm. I really liked it. And, and he and I became unlikely friends. The nuns didn't approve of this, by of the course. way. Of course. So we would, when people weren't around, we would chat and then we'd kind of go our way as the nun came on. And I didn't like the way the nuns treated him. Mm -hmm. And that that anger developed into civil rights. So you know, I was I was <clears throat> I wouldn't say eased out, and I wasn't quite kicked out because I got out before they did it. But I was on my way out of San Francisco State for my political views, which is interesting in thinking that San Francisco State then became sort of a hotbed for political. Oh, conflict. oh this was the, this was in the midst of that time. Uh -huh. Oh right. yeah, but that, but you see. But as faculty, you were probably uh... my roommate when I came to state in 1965 was S.I. Hayakawa. Ah. Now this was a deliberate slight wow. on the part of the of the English department to put a new assistant professor doubling up in what would have normally been a full professor's sole occupancy mm -hmm. of his of his home room. And it was really kind of intended as a slight. The, the department ident identified what Hayakawa was doing as hokey and, you know, wasn't really scholarship. It wasn't really anything. It was some kind of social studies attempt at uh, uh, a pencil one is not pencil two. Wow. Considering what an impact he had on that institution. Yeah, well... Surprising to hear. Yeah, well, and then he became, of course, the, the head of the school. Yeah, president of the school. By that yeah. time, I was under attack. Uh, I had made my views known in various ways. I'd been arrested for sitting in at the school. Oh, you were a hippie radical. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, so when they started a tenure hearing on me, uh, Ephraim Margolin, my wonderful, he was a big time criminal lawyer who did pro bono civil rights work. So when all this stuff started, he had his uh, uh, private eye checking out what was going on and discovered that there was a committee called Committee of One. It's like a bad 70s Sounds you know, like paranoid it, yeah. movie. Yeah. And one of their uh, objects was to get me out of school. So you specifically? Yeah. So they had a private detective who was looking at all my stuff and doing whatever he could. And there, there, there just came a time when the, this all got so crazy. And I, it was just before Christmas vacation. My marriage was breaking up. I had a wonderful wife. It was the 60s. I was a terrible husband. And... Uh, <clears throat> You know, it was a t it was, I wasn't happy not making music. I wanted to do, I walked out the door, shut the door for Christmas vacation. I didn't even clear out my desk. Wow. I never came back. Hmm. That was, that was the transition. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, and I, when I think about it, I mean, God, how, how bold to, to give, I'm giving up a career. Well, and especially in those days, it was very unusual for a person to have multiple careers, not like now. Yeah. And so I think walking, walking out on that was definitely bold. On the other hand, it seems that you were in a no-win situation. So mm -hmm. clearly this was... Yeah. And, and also, I think you saw the future for yourself as something different, clearly. I... I, I... You know, when you're that age, I mean, I was... Well, you're indestructible for one thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and you don't think about the future in the way you do later in life because you you're, you're really are in the now. Sure, sure. And, uh, what, you know, what are we going to do tonight? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I did it. And uh, my becoming ex-wife, you know, I said, you know, you're really making a huge mistake, blah, 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 blah. I went to my dad. My dad was a successful businessman. I said, Dad, I'd like to borrow $20,000, which was a lot of money then. Yeah. I wanted to start a recording studio. This would have been in the late 60s, early 70s? No, late. It was mid-60s. Okay. Well, no, it was late 60s. It was 1967 Christmas. And you were in San Francisco? Yeah. That was quite, a, quite an era in San oh, Francisco. Oh, yes, it uh -huh. was. Mm -hmm. So my dad 
well, wait, why do you want to borrow this money? I told him I was quitting teaching. He was horrified. <clears throat> and I'm going to start a recording studio. It's going to take $20,000. It took a lot more than that to do this. And he said, well, he said, I'm sorry, son, but I won't lend you the money. Okay. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you $20,000. That's the last time in your life you're ever to ask me for money. Don't ever do it again. <laughs> oh, my God. So the, the 20000 <laughs> yeah, $20,000, of course, did not get us to different fur. Of course. I became a dope dealer. I was dealing... Um, that can be profitable, especially back then. It was good. Mm -hmm. It was good. And I had a friend uh, who was the chemist for the Hells Angels. Ah. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon I was making probably 500 a week, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it was more than twice my, my teacher's salary. <laughs> <laughs> Not I was to getting, mention making lots of new friends, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, had, I was getting 10000 a week as, a, a year as a... Um, uh, as a professor, as, yeah. Assistant professor, mm -hmm. and I was making 500 a week uh, as a part-time dope dealer. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that got different for going. At some point, you obviously got your hands on, I guess, must, must have been a Moog modular or something like that? Well, I had a friend, John Vieira, who was an electrical engineer, a hippie engineer, mm -hmm. And he had bought a small system, which is all he could afford. So one of the things I did with this 20000 was, was I invested about less, less than 10, but almost half of it, in expanding the Moog. Uh -huh. And we had a little, uh, let's call it a studio, although it wasn't. There was a closet uh -huh. that opened out into a bedroom. The closet became the uh, control room, and the bedroom was the studio. The tracking room, yeah, of yeah, course. And uh -huh. uh, we soon realized that wasn't going to work. So um, we traded studio time with a, a young man who went out, and his job was to find us a place. He found us 3470 19th Street, which is where Different Fur is today. Yes. And um, there we are. Coming back to the idea of synthesis, mm -hmm. you're coming into this new instrument with completely different musical priorities, let's say, and a completely different musical approach than a lot of your peers. Well, you know, yes and no, because um, I was very influenced by Wendy. Oh, of course, no question. And in fact, she wrote the liner notes to my first album. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I loved Mort's first, uh, first yeah. and second albums. But so, they're again, completely different. They're type completely of different approach. And, um, and I, I did a couple of classical albums. I don't know if you... I, I know you did, but at the same time, your classical, your classical approach and Wendy's, you know, completely divergent in that sense, your classical approach sounds jazz-tinged, hmm. if I may say. <laughs> you know? That's interesting. Your swing is a little different, shall we say, yeah. you know? I think so far as, as, as the synthesis of classical music goes, only one person ever solved the problem. Well, and I would agree Wendy. with you. That would have been Wendy, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's my question to you. Is okay. Because you were approaching it from a completely different perspective, mm -hmm. and because you, because your own experience as a musician was different, did you find that you were then, did you find that you became pigeonholed as a synthesis as, as opposed to being recognized as a musician who plays the synthesizer. Oh yeah, absolutely. And in fact, many people didn't consider it was making music. Uh, when I joined the Musicians Union, um, they said, well, um, what is it you play? I told them, hmm. Well, um, we don't have a checkbox for that. <laughs> <laughs> they said, we, we, we'd like to hear what you can do with that. Uh, We'll set up a time, and you can bring your uh, what is it again? Um, your, your synthesizer. <laughs> your sympathizer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you can bring it down here, and, and let's let's see whether we we believe you're eligible to be, join a musicians union. Uh -huh. I said okay. Uh, there, there were steep steps going up to the musicians second floor 
Union. And, and you're I, schlepping this modular up there. I, no, I didn't. I, oh. I told them I, I couldn't do it. We need people to help. I said, I said, you're also going to need speakers and amplifiers. Oh, okay. <laughs> they signed up. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't, they weren't convinced. And, they, and the musicians' union saw it. In a way, they were right as an incredible threat. Oh, no question. Yeah. In fact, um, you probably are familiar with a musician named Don Lewis. Oh, sure. I know. I've known and Don for years. Don tells a lot of stories about the intimidation factor of the Musicians' Union, particularly in San Francisco, mm -hmm. regarding what they, what they felt was infringing upon other musicians. Right, right. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you probably ran into a lot of that because there was really a... Well, what happened to me was, uh, you know, through good fortune, very soon as, uh, uh, when Different Fur was up, I began getting ad business. That was the first business I had. I did some sc scores for P PBS. Mm -hmm. And then the Rockers found me. So I'm getting business from, you know, Sammy Hagar and Journey and those folks. Right. And, um, and then Herbie's opportunity came along, you know. And, and when I, I had been taking, at, after the last session of the day, I would take, which was then a 16 track, um, of I uh, copied onto it, uh, Bitches Brew. Uh -huh. And I would overdub my overdubs on synthesizer to Bitches Brew. And of course, I was wow. knocked out by it. When I heard that Herbie was going to be, you know, working with uh, David Rubinson, I went to David. I'd been doing some stuff for some acts of his and, um, you know, little stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I told him, you know, I can do this, David. I, uh, um, I want you to hear what I've done. Oh, okay. I, I can't really. <laughs> he was busy. <laughs> and he was a little bit dismissive. Yes. But then Herbie talked to him, and he, Herbie wanted to get more into electronics. So then David apparently told Herbie, he said, you know, I'll set you up with this guy. He's not really a musician, because David didn't know that I had any background in music before since. So he saw you as mainly an engineer or a programmer? Yeah, and he uh -huh. said, you know, he can set up the instrument for you. Mm-hmm. And thank God for Herbie being Herbie. He came over <laughs> and uh, he said, well, was, you know, he put up, he came in with it with one side of the album. He put it up. It turned out to be Quasar and uh, <clears throat> Benny Mob and Tune. He said, well, we, you know, I, my partner, John Vieira, was the engineer and we got in about two or three minutes. He said, it's maybe something right there. So we stopped. I patch. I'm patching like crazy. And I'm thinking, God, I don't want this guy to be impatient and walk out. So Herbie said, okay. I said, well, how about that? He said, yeah. Yeah, that's... Did you record it? I said, well, I'm setting it up for you to play. Herbie said, oh, you're doing fine. Well, just go ahead and record it. So we did that for probably another 30 minutes. Herbie tells the story in his, bio, his autobiography. And he said, uh, I'm just going to leave it to you. I'll be back. Later, he didn't specify when. I worked all night. <laughs> By the time he came back the next late morning or early afternoon, I had overdubbed every available track on half of the album. <laughs> <laughs> and Herbie, you know, he said later, I mean, he said it blew his mind. He'd never heard anything like it. So that was the beginning, really, of my career. Uh -huh. That's where it really started. Now, I'm curious. Now, you skipped over a part here where you go from being a musician to opening a studio and all of a sudden you are now running a studio, which mm. means of course, having to learn a whole different class of not only gear, mm. Mm -hmm. but a whole different mindset because engineering mm -hmm. is a completely different right. discipline. You've got to run a studio. You're running a studio. I don't know what kind of console you had in those Harrison. days. Okay. So you have to get your head around a Harrison console, a two inch machine, all of this other technology, and then you're working with agencies, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which is another mentality and another complete world. And then you're working with rockers, mm -hmm. which again is another. Yeah. So all of these other influences are coming in right. at the same time. How does this impact you as a musician? I don't think that the early stuff I did with the rockers or with the ad agencies 
had much effect because it wasn't that much. To be, well, you know okay. what I'm saying. But maybe not the music itself. But I'm wondering about the transition for you from being a musician to being an engineer for other people's music. Mm -hmm. How did that impact you and your creative process? I didn't do that for very long. You, you know what happened was, I mean, the the studio was set up. Uh, it was the end of '68 because we we we. I got, I got out of teaching in uh, Christmas of 67. So it was maybe even 69 by the time the studio was set up. By 71, I'm on the road with Herbie. So you really were almost owning the studio in absentia at that point. Which was my partner's uh -huh. point. He, he didn't, he didn't <laughs> like it very much. much. Okay. And, I, and I said, you know, here's the thing, John. It's going to give us a lot of business. And it did. People came from all over the country. Sure. I mean, overdub. studio so, had a great reputation, no question. Well, and, and also synthesizers were still so kind of rare that people would come to have me yeah. overdub on... As I said, it was you and Bernie Krause, pretty much, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> At least in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. And then, well, and then very shortly after that, um, what was the wonderful man who died? Patrick Cowley. Yes, and, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and something, I guess, because of my political stance, and which is really a, is a life stance, um, we got all the gay record business. Sure, sure. I mean, they, we loved them and they loved us. And so the studio is extremely busy with all that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the black musicians from Oakland realized, okay, this is a place where I'm actually adequately respected. Mm -hmm. And of course I was in love with <laughs> with all their music so of course, yeah. it made it you know a, a, a very welcoming place to to play and eventually you know we had stevie wonder <laughs> i mean did you have sly in there no sly never came bb they had a, a room set up for sly at the record plant okay. his own room that makes sense because yeah. sly was so influential in the bay area music scene at that right, point right no i never the same time i never i don't you know what i don't think i ever talked to sly Interesting. Uh, his bass player came over, and we we did we did a fruitless session or two. Uh -huh. Some sessions, you know, with synthesizers, it w it was hit or miss. They got it, or I got it, or they didn't get it, or I didn't get it. Right. And right. there were some some really good musicians where really there was no reason for a synthesizer to be on their records, and they just thought, you know, it's happening, so let's do it. I think that's interesting that because you were a synthesis, first and foremost, mm -hmm. the expectations were different. You know, this guy's going to do something different on our record. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if it fits or not, but damn it, this is the icing I want on this cake. Yeah, yeah. I, the, I think the, the, of all those rock sessions, the one I loved the best was the one with Pablo Cruz because Bill Schnee was the engineer. Ah. And I, this wonderful moment. So by this time... <clears throat> I'm, we're set up in the control room. Why go out to the other? So Bill is engineering, and he, he's getting things ready. And while he's doing that, he's playing back one of the tunes. So I begin just, you know, fooling around. Uh -huh. So at a certain point, Bill stops. He says, okay. I said, yeah. I said, I'm ready. He said, okay. You want to listen to what you've recorded? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know it was beautiful uh it became a platinum album or maybe it was too funny uh -huh. yeah yeah first takes always the best you yeah, know what yeah. they say always being recorded so cool i mean mm -hmm. and the, the, the guys from palo cruz were really neat, neat too in fact they asked me to join their band and but i after herbie that that was not a yeah another thing that was happening during this era mm -hmm. was of course the evolution of all the technology yeah I mean, synthesizers, of course, were becoming, you know, not only mainstream, but you had different types of synthesizers, sure. different flavors, samplers were coming in. And you had then, of course, the advent of MIDI. Mm -hmm. Right. And Huge. eventually Huge. then the advent of the DAW. Mm -hmm. Right. And you no longer had to splice tape and stuff like that. Yeah. How did all of that evolution impact your creative process? I'm a, um, my daughter said, you know, Dad, you're so superficial. If anything is new, you want to do it. 
<laughs> My kids tell me that all the time, too. Okay, there yes, you go. Yes. See? So I loved it. I just moved right along. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I, I paid $300,000 for my Synclavier and sold it for 10000 and thought that was a good deal. Hey, you know. But, but it's interesting to me that for all of us during that particular period of time, so many things changed, especially, you know, if you talk about, for example, uh, a lot of the music that you were, the Oakland scene, yeah. for example, so much of that was MIDI driven mm-hmm. and Lindrum driven mm-hmm. and so much of what was happening in music, you know, the, the disco era, EDM right. as we call it now, yeah. whatever, you know, <laughs> all of that was so influenced by this development of this metric technology that would you know, do everything on a mm-hmm. pulse mm-hmm. and the ability to hit an undo key and the ability to sample and all of these things. I, I can't imagine that that must, I mean, that must have been just mind boggling for you in terms of all the things that from one day to the next, all of a sudden, oh, now I can do this. Now yeah, I can yeah. sample this. I loved it. I never, yeah. I never saw it as a, even as a challenge. Uh huh. You know, I just, oh, oh it's oh, an opportunity. Now, now I yeah. can do this. You exactly. Know? Exactly. Yeah. I, as the new technology came around, I'd seen one thing with Herbie. He, I mean, you know, he's an amazing musician. Mm-hmm. Um, he's even better than people think he is, and they think he's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but to, to be sitting next to that guy for over a year, almost every night of the, of the year, uh, you just really realize the difference between being a very good musician and being Herbie. Uh-huh. It's a different level. Oh, his mind works in a completely different way. Yeah, it's, it's really true. He's very smart. Yes. I always felt that, that amazing as Herbie was, that he really, even during the eras when he's been, since he's been playing synthesizers, he's never quite gotten into them at the same level. I mean, it's probably presumptuous to say this because he's got gold records based on his synthesis. But I never felt his synthesis was quite where his musicality was generally. I never felt that he achieved the same level. I know he didn't as a synthesis as he has as a musician. And the reason is that he didn't need to. Sure. So Because his chops are enough. You know, right. I mean, so I every time that a new technology came around, no matter how much I loved what I was doing before, I dropped it like a hot rock. So um, when the the Synclavier came out, I got rid of all my analog gear. (laughs) I mean, and the reason was I wanted to force myself, as Herbie didn't have to force himself, I wanted to be in the position that Pat Gleason was when he joined Herbie. I had to learn this shit. I didn't have any choice. Uh And so I did that. You know, I I, I gave, didn't give away, but I sold um, a huge... Uh, analog system, which is now in a museum in Canada, uh-huh. and uh, and then when when MIDI came out, I dropped the beautiful Synclavier like a hot rock uh-huh. and went my way. And now uh, that th- there's DAWs and I I don't have any hardware. I don't have I the only thing I've got is a keyboard. And now in performances, I don't even use that. You don't use a keyboard live. I did. I did for the first year I was playing live. Uh-huh. Uh, Michael Shreve straightened me out. He said, "Pat, you're just limiting yourself." He said, "You know, you have all this 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 ability to make all these different sounds." He said, "Just make them and find a way to use them in a live performance. For, improvise with them." So what I did was I went to Ableton and I got some special software, uh, some smart guys made for me. Uh-huh. And I can, and I've got several layers of specialized software, but, but basically what I do when I walk out on stage is I have this matrix pulled up in what's called Session View in Ableton. Mm-hmm. And I'll have, for a given tune, I'll have maybe five or 600 different clips And so I'll, you're just triggering, you're triggering playback, basically. I'm triggering playback and every clip, but every clip has various permutations and mutations. This clip will turn off all these clips. This identical clip will not. So in the performance, as I'm moving through the performance, I'm improvising the result. 
it's almost an extension of that same musique concrète. It is. It absolutely is. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And and you can screw up. It's well, possible yeah. to screw up. <laughs> but isn't that part of it? It is. That's the fun. That's why I love doing it. I I've never. That, that was one of the reasons I didn't ever join a rock group. I, I was on the road with one, and then Pablo Cruz asked me to join them. I thought the idea of doing the same music in pretty much the same way every night. Right. Here's your solo, eight bars. Don't don't go any further. It's yeah. just mm -hmm. a turn off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could see that from from your particular perspective, especially coming from jazz. Mm -hmm. It's the advantage that you had in learning and embracing a brand new musical art form was that you could completely take it anywhere you wanted. Exactly. I want to segue from that. Yeah. Because at some point you started working in, in uh, composing, in film scoring. Yeah. Again, completely different worlds and yeah. completely different disciplines. And what's interesting to me is a lot of musicians who get into composing it's almost like an either or thing. You're either a recording musician mm -hmm. or you're a film scoring guy. Yeah. If you're a film scoring guy, people know you if they're into film scoring. For you, was that a logical transition? And when you made that transition, did it change the way you were perceived as a musician? People forgot about me. That's what I'm that's yeah. what I'm wondering. Did you become invisible? I became sort of invisible. Uh, and I'm still pretty invisible. I mean, uh, a couple of articles that have been written about me talk about they are the best kept secret in music, you know. <clears throat> and uh, only only forty some odd years of it at least, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And uh, it's good to be an overnight success. <laughs> yes, right. And you know, I, ultimately, I think the, the working in film and television was really that was my grad school. That was where I, 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 because you get, you know, you get a, uh, an assignment. Uh, it's got a, a brutal deadline. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, when I was doing Knots Landing, I would get the, um, I'd get the tapes on Monday, and I'd have to be on the sound stage Thursday. Right. Right. So it's thirty-five minutes of music. Yep. And 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 a plane ride. <laughs> <laughs> and you better have it composed and ready. Oh, yeah. if you ever, 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 ever missed, you were out. Yeah. And I got was a lot of very profitable business from Disney. Where it all started was, there was a guy by the name of Buddy Baker, who was a, a big time uh, Disney composer. Okay. Mm -hmm. And times are changing, and the younger people in Disney thought Buddy was out of date. So they told Buddy, you know, we're rejecting this. Find us somebody that's new. So I... So you were the new kid. I get an interview with Buddy Baker. And he's got a little sheet on this desk. And it's got the names of people mostly better known than me. <laughs> <laughs> and, but by my name, it says Bulletproof. I got the gig. Wow. Yeah. Because... I was always able to meet a deadline in a satisfactory way. I'm curious for you also, beginning to then work as a composer. Mm -hmm. First of all, as you say, different demands. Yeah. And different I had musical, no training. Yeah, I had different no training. musical tra uh, demands. Yeah. All of a sudden, you have to not only create music differently, but create music to a completely different set of, as you say, restrictions, demands. Oh, sure. Was that again, just like the, the urge to, I got to try something new, I'm yeah, bored? It was, it, I, I didn't know enough when I left Herbie to do what I would have done if I had, which is I would have formed my own group. Mm -hmm. One of the, the execs from Columbia told me, you know, this is what you need to do. And then about six months later when I had, and he said, see, I told you so. <laughs> 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 but I didn't know enough, uh -huh. you know. And so what I did do in, in I think, th something like 30 years that I did music for film and television, is I became a, a composer. And I loved it. I didn't love the limitations. Uh, I didn't love Hollywood. Sure. But musically speaking, I think what's cool about composing is that you have 
a lot fewer restrictions in other ways because you don't have to do a three minute movie. You don't have to do a standard pop form right. format or anything like that. Right. You really can be very, you're yeah. painting colors yeah. essentially. The, the woman I worked for who was one of the producers, she wasn't the supervising producers, producer, but she was the woman who, she came in for, um, as a secretary mm -hmm. years ago for the production company that did Dallas and all this stuff, and they did Knots Landing. She taught me so much about writing for television, wow. more than anybody else. And I remember the very first session, spotting session they're called, as you know, mm -hmm. Uh, which is the session where the people in charge tell you where they want the music and what they want the music right. to do. So we get to a certain point where I'm expecting her to say, okay, that's it. I, I, so, so we're going to end it. No, no, just, just keep it going. Over here? Just keep it going. It can be just a thin line. Keep it going. Then she finally, at the end of that session, she turned to me. She said, Pat, you know, after your in for about 30, 40 seconds. They don't even hear you anymore. You can do anything you want. <laughs> 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 he said, that's where you can really have an influence. Right. Because right. now you're reaching their subconscious. I and mean, she didn't say that. Um, but it's really true. And it's, yeah. in a certain sense, I mean, you don't think of it that way. And especially if you are coming to that from a more traditional musician's background, yeah. you know, you really expect... I mean, the goal for a musician, especially a performing musician, is to have people paying attention. Mm -hmm. Whereas the goal in scoring is almost to become part of the canvas. Yeah, you have an influence. Uh, yeah. Right, exactly. Right, yeah. But be almost invisible. Yeah, yeah. When you got into film scoring, mm -hmm. did this, was this also a part of your getting into the, what we now call immersive? When I played Moogfest, which turned out to be the last, the very Moogfest, last one, yeah, yes, mm -hmm. there was a guy there that invited me to dinner, and it turned out he invited fifteen or twenty people to dinner and picked up the tab and so forth. A very interesting guy, and he said, "You know, I want to do something with you." Well, it turned out he's the guy that invented this new means. It's called Quark, of of having a single file that co can address both stereo and quadraphonic environments. Uh -huh. The guy's a genius. I mean, he's so fucking bright. It's, he's scary bright. His, his name is Cameron V. Oh, yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so Cameron has just sort of like picked me up and carried me to where I am now. I mean, he's the producer of this album. Mm -hmm. And his suggestions are just wonderful. And I did not mix. I mean, I've been a mixer all my life. I mixed this album in, in stereo and gave him the stems, you know, not the stereo mix, but, but my stems. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you know, let's see what you can come up with. So he, called, he invited me down to his house down in the South Coast. And I listened to, I sat in this little kind of mini studio. Uh -huh. And with these four speakers, each one about this big, uh -huh. but they're surrounding me. It made me cry. I mean, it was so beautiful. And even, you know, I later played that music for Herbie, and Herbie said, this music is made for quad. So, so was this part of the inspiration for doing this album? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the stuff that you've remixed in this album, you know, is... Again, as to quote Herbie, just really, it's made for quad. It's yeah. made for it, it. Well, it's made for sir. It's made for immersive. immersive. Yeah. I hate the term. I've gotten so tired yeah. of the term. Yeah, but it uh, really is true. It's we're, uh, we're releasing it in Atmos also. One last question for you. You came up in an era where things were so experimental. Yes. Music has, of course, gotten very commodified. Right very homogenized. Mm -hmm. There is no real artist development yeah, right. the way there was. It's horrifying. Do you see any parallels? Do you see uh, the possibility for experimentation, uh, anything new on the horizon in this day and age? 
Well, in a sense, yes. I mean, what's happened is that there are so many people developing things technologically that it, it you know if if you're if you're paying attention, mm -hmm. you are moving forward because there's all these new tools. As I said, I I probably have I don't even know maybe four hundred six hundred programs on my Mac dot. So um, I'm on my Mac. So you're going to move forward if you're paying attention. Uh, on the other hand, the environment is horrifying. And yeah. uh, trying to make a living as a musician is just horrifying now. You sure. know, the, the, the first public performance I had that was where I was, quote, the headliner <clears throat> was at the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco in 1966, I think. I was absolutely nobody. I walked in. I wanted to talk to the man in charge, who turned out to be Henry Hopkins. Uh -huh. And I said, I want to put on a happening. What, what did you have in mind? Well, you know, I described my, my understanding of a happening, which I'd never seen. <laughs> <clears throat> and maybe it was 67. He said, well, uh, when did you want to do this? I said, well, uh, as soon as possible. Now, this was probably February. He said, well, um, we, we really are pretty booked up until probably the end of March. <laughs> so, by the, Ooh, brutal. <laughs> yeah, by the end of March, I'm in a room that holds and was pretty filled with probably 600 people. I have a light crew going, which was my introduction to Bruce Connor, the artist. Ah, uh -huh. And then our long... You really did do a happening, didn't you? Yes, we mm -hmm. do. Oh, listen, let me tell you. So the air was is, fragrant. Okay, let me tell you. <laughs> so Bruce said... He, ben Man Meter was, it was his light show. I invited Ben. Bruce was part of the crew. Bruce said, well, what are we doing here? This is what we do every Friday and Saturday night at the Avalon. It should be different. Ben, well, it's fine with me. Pat, what do you think? Well, I'm, 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 whatever you say, Ben. I didn't know Bruce. So there were these two big screens there were probably 20 by 20 that were backlit screens back projection screens and then the light show is behind that uh, my band is behind there my bad imitations of bob dylan is going on the <laughs> mic and i'm doing an elegy for walt disney and an elegy for john muir those were the two pieces wow. yeah <laughs> yeah and uh so we get to obviously the last three, four, five, ten minutes. Suddenly, Bruce darts out from behind this line of guys doing liquid projection, and he runs over and he grabs one of the light, the back projection screens and pulls it away so that it's exposing the, 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 the uh, light show and the, the guys doing the projecting. The second screen falls over. I mean, these things are huge. I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, who's going to be killed? And... The, the program ends as it was supposed to, except that now the projectors are running right into people's faces. Yikes. So a friend of mine comes up, hip, hip friend of mine. She says, God, man, that was really something. She says, you know, I, I got to admit, I, I didn't get it. Until those screens came down, I wasn't even sure I liked it. Then finally, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that was part yeah, of the plan. We, we meant to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, Bruce was a good teacher for me. He was one of the people. I would say there were, musically speaking, Herbie, of course, just by osmosis. Mm -hmm. uh, Gil Evans by intent. Uh -huh. He came to the first gig at the, uh, the both, uh, not the both end, but um, Village. Uh, he was a tremendously overlooked talent. Well, not really by musicians. No, but by the public, I think he could he, have been he, he so did, big. He didn't know. care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, again, that's the sort of the jazz ethos, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But he, he was getting into synthesizers. He fell in love with what I was doing. He invited me over to his, his house every night or every afternoon that week. And we would listen. He would come to the gig, tape it on the cassette recorder, and we would listen. And he would stop and quiz me at various points. I remember one time he said, 
what's going on there? I said, Gil, I, I, I couldn't think of a thing to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens to me a lot. <laughs> uh, you know, I, when it does, I mean, I, you know, what can you do? I just put my hands in my lap and start listening. Listening to the guys, and pretty soon I find I'm playing again. <laughs> That's true, because then listening to everything else, you start yeah. percolating a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but he was a wonderful teacher that way. So I had, I had Gil, Bruce, and, and I mean, my God, and, and Herbie. How could I fail? You've had quite a roller coaster, actually. Yeah. You've had quite a roller coaster of a career. I mean, yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of the way you've, the way your creative arc has gone, mm -hmm. it's very serendipitous in a lot of ways. I've know? been very lucky. Yeah. Good God, yeah. I've been lucky. Well, but you've also taken some chances, you know, and That's I think that first is, thing. is that not yeah. really the, the, really the, the crux might, of it all. It might be the heart of it. I mean, yeah. When I was playing uh, with uh, Michael Shreve and Sam Morris, a little trio gig in Seattle, and um, a, a, a black man, probably 50 years old, came up. In the, there were two sets, came up between sets and started talking to me. And uh, it was very, you know, into the music and it was a pleasant conversation. And he said, almost as an aside, he said, you know what I've always really liked about you? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. He said, you've never been afraid to take a chance. And I thought, God, that's probably true. I had never thought about that, really. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you just move ahead. I thought, well, I think of my career. I mean, I've been out there where I, I you know, I, I've been at the edge of a 100-foot cliff so many times. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You have, and you have taken really some kind of almost oddball chances anyway <laughs> on things that you know as you say when you're young and fearless yeah you know there are things that we do yeah that you know you think to yourself you know 20 years later i probably would have done that you know well now i can do anything i want because well, you know yeah there you go i mean you know <laughs> you well, get to a point where you're completely how bad could it be? i'll be <laughs> dead in a few years <laughs> well and i you know we have a running joke my wife and i have a running joke about how as the older you get, the less filtered you are. Yeah, you that's know? true. And, you know, we, we have to laugh about some of these, like, these little old ladies who, you know, they'll just say whatever the hell's on their mind. <laughs> you know? I think that's brilliant. But you've reached a, a really interesting point in your career. I will yeah. give you that. And I think um, a lot of it has to do with taking chances. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you really don't have a choice. You just think you do. I mean, if you don't take the chance, then nothing's going to happen. Well, and what do they say? Inaction is action. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so you have... Yeah, and you know that old rock and roll joke that had... The, it's not a very funny joke, but the punchline is great. Fuck them if they can't take a joke. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. What is, what, what's, what's, what's to lose? Exactly. Patrick Leeson, thank you for being my guest. Oh, it was fun. It's been thank quite you. a pleasure. Thank you. It was. I enjoyed it. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.